On another day, I woke up early in the morning and saw that the windows of the cabin, where I had gone for a few weekends with friends to hunt, were completely covered with a whimsical pattern of frozen icicles. It was winter, but when we arrived, there was no snow yet, only the biting cold trying to penetrate through the clothes, nipping at my cheeks and chin. Apparently, it snowed overnight, and I thought it was good because we could now see animal tracks to hunt. I had long been passionate about hunting, my father and grandfather were hunters too. However, I mostly lived in the city, where I had shared my home with my wife Anna for over 20 years, and we had a wonderful son named Scott. He, however, was not in a hurry to start his own family. I also had a job that took up a lot of my time, but I didn't complain because I was paid enough to support my family and even save some money. In this winter month, when I had a few consecutive days off, I decided to spend them on my peculiar hobby. The cabin belonged to my father, he still lived there and always welcomed my visits. Unfortunately, my mother had passed away a few years ago, and I had suggested to my father to move closer to the city, but he refused. I stepped out of my room, and my friends Matthew and Harry were already chatting about something at the dining table, while my father was preparing his signature breakfast for everyone. I approached him, offering the help, as I felt a bit awkward seeing from having to fiddle around serving us with his sometimes shaky old hands. Don't touch, my father muttered with a smile. You know my house is always at your service and that of your friends, but the kitchen is my territory. Yes, as far back as I could remember, he always loved to cook, especially excelling in preparing meat and game. Now he was cooking a rabbit that we had shot the day before. Hello. I greeted my friends and sat down with them at the table, pouring myself a cup of morning tea. I went out in the morning, it seems even colder now. We should dress warmer when we go back into the woods, Matthew said. Maybe we can just relax today? Harry suggested, who usually preferred warmth. We've been hunting for three days already. We've got enough game. We can skip a day. But how? We came here specifically for hunting, not to warm our backsides, I argued. It's even good that it snowed. I think we can head out in an hour. So, get ready. After breakfast, everyone went to their rooms to prepare for the next outing. However, I lingered in the kitchen to have a little chat with my father. Son, you should have brought Scott with you. I would like to see my grandson again. I feel that I don't have much time left, my father said. Come on, Dad. You're not that old. You still have a lot of life ahead of you. It's too early for you to say goodbye to life. I know what I'm saying. Your mother appeared in my dream today. I would like to talk to him one last time. I have something important to discuss with him. Okay, if you insist, I can call him to come here, I said, starting to search my pockets for my phone but couldn't find it. Strange. I vividly remember taking my phone with me this morning. I'll go look for it. Returning to my room, I started rummaging through my things, thinking I might have left it somewhere. Soon I found it in my winter jacket, but the battery was almost dead, so I put it on charge. I'll do it later, I informed my father when I returned to him. The battery is dead. Can you tell me what you want to talk to him about? It's none of your business. I told you it's a conversation I need to have with him, my father replied sternly. I didn't argue and after chatting with him a bit about something else, I went to prepare for another trip into the woods. By the time I was ready, my phone had charged, and I dialed my son's number. However, Anna answered the call for some reason. Oh. How did you get here? I was slightly surprised. Scott wasn't planning to come to us. He just arrived. Aren't you glad? She replied. Of course, I am. Call him. I need to talk to him. I heard her calling our son to the phone, and soon I made him an offer to come over. Scott initially refused, saying he didn't like our activity, and it was too cold. But I insisted, adding that his grandfather really wanted to see him. So, my son agreed to come, but only the next day since he already had plans for the day. After pleasing my father that he would soon meet his grandson, I went to the woods with my friends. There, we soon found deer tracks and set up a small ambush. Occasionally sipping from flasks of strong spirits that my father had given us to keep warm, we lay on the snow and waited for the deer to come closer. Harry kept complaining that he was still freezing and even wanted to return to the cabin, 
but Matthew and I scolded him, telling him not to act like a child. Moreover, we had ventured much farther into the woods than usual that day, and I didn't want him wandering alone. You're trying to educate me while you should sort things out with your own family, grumbled Harry when he got tired of my lecturing. I don't understand. What do you mean? I asked. I said, you'd better keep an eye on your wife. Do you think while you're here relaxing, she's at home, being a good wife, waiting for you? It's clear that as soon as she gets the chance, she'll arrange a meeting with some handsome guy. That's why she's been dressing up so much lately. His words sounded quite insolent and cut deep into me. I love my wife, and I trusted her completely. Yes, I noticed that she started paying more attention to her appearance, but she said she wasn't as young anymore and just tried to look better. What? What did you say? I even threw my rifle aside and leaned on him, grabbing his fur collar. I said what I heard. I told you the plain truth. You're just a blind idiot if you don't notice anything. Remember our last party in the city? Even then, she shamelessly tried to flirt with me. But I turned her down and didn't want to tell you anything. You're just my friend. You're lying. I interrupted him and pressed even harder him into the snow. Maybe you tried to make advances towards her? Hey, hey. Stop it, intervened Matthew. You're getting worked up for no reason. Harry, are you an idiot? What nonsense are you babbling about? Offended that they didn't leave you at home? Well, get the hell out of here and don't bother us. Sorry, mumbled Harry to me. I released him, pushing him a bit into the snow, and returned to observing. Soon, we spotted a deer, and I managed to be the first to shoot it. However, Harry's words still lingered in my mind, and for some reason, it seemed to me that he didn't say it just like that. Sometimes, in a burst of passion, he could blur out something similar, but it had never touched on my wife's fidelity before. Now, I even pondered a little, wondering if it was just his impulsive outburst or if he was telling the truth. I did not pursue the subject further, for it was the easiest thing to argue with a friend. But I also wanted to find out the truth, and I hoped that when my son came to visit, I could find out something from him, for while I was away he had visited his mother. And I thought he might have noticed something. The next day, Scott arrived only by lunchtime. Almost immediately, he expressed his dissatisfaction with being dragged here, as his car got stuck in a snowdrift on the way, and he had to put in some effort to move forward. However, I was still glad that he made it and brushed off his complaints. I even forgot about what I wanted to ask him the day before. We all gathered around the table again, and my father placed a bottle of his homemade moonshine on the table. Here, he said. It's time for the youngest to try my drink. He handed Scott a mug. At first, the conversation revolved around various unimportant life details. But I noticed that my father hardly took his eyes off my son. It seemed to me that he truly felt that his time was running out, and he just wanted to enjoy his grandson thoroughly. Then, my father ushered me and my friends into another room, closing the door with him and my son inside. They talked about something for almost an hour. I became very curious about what could be discussed for so long, even trying to eavesdrop through the door. However, they spoke in almost a whisper, and I couldn't hear anything. Returning to my friends, who were sitting by the fireplace, I joined them for a drink and waited for my son to come back from his grandfather. After a while, the door creaked softly, and Scott appeared in the room where we were sitting. He looked a bit concerned, or rather, offended and angry. What happened, son? I asked with concern in my voice. Nothing. It's time for me to go. I can't stay any longer, he replied somewhat rudely. But Scott, explain what's going on. You just arrived. Stay, spend the night, and leave tomorrow morning if you find it so boring here. But Scott stood his ground and began to prepare for departure. I was not just worried about him. The radio had promised a snowstorm by evening, and I didn't want him to get stuck somewhere on the way. However, my son replied that he would reach the city before the snow started falling again and set off on his journey. The weather indeed took a turn for the worse a few hours later, and the wind was so strong that it seemed it would soon blow open doors and windows and invade the house. Then, unexpectedly, the power went out. My father and I went to check the fuses, 
but they were fine, evidently, the stone had caused power lines to break somewhere. But we didn't have to sit in the dark either. My father was resourceful and brought several kerosene lamps and candles from the pantry so that we wouldn't drain the batteries and flashlights and phones. Besides, the phones themselves were not very useful that evening, as the communication was also lost. Neither mobile phones nor my father's landline worked. We spent the night, as in pre-flood times, by candlelight and fireplace, and my father even hung the kettle over the fire in the hearth. It was not until morning that the weather calmed down a little. I went outside to see if the road was too snowy, for our vacation was coming to an end, and my friends and I had to get back. I checked my cell phone to see that it still had no reception here. Well, it's time for us to get going, I said to my father. We still need to go to work, and Anna is probably worried. Dad, will you finally tell me what you talked about with my son? I'm uneasy about him leaving so gloomy. What did you do to him? I didn't do anything to him. He has to figure himself out and choose the right path in life. But I'm glad I managed to give him some advice before leaving this world. After all, he himself will never come to me again. Why are you saying such things, Dad? If necessary, I'll force him to come here. Don't bother, son. Everything is fine. Go to your wife. My friends and I got into my SUV and headed towards the city. It was more challenging to drive back as small drifts formed on the road in some places, and in others, it was covered with ice. I tried not to drive too fast to avoid skidding on the turns, keeping an eye on the road ahead. Oh, it seems someone never made it here, Harry suddenly said. We turned our gaze to him and then in the direction he was looking, out the window. A little further into the ditch under the trees, the trunk of a car was visible. Obviously, someone had been in an accident. The car's color resembled my son's vehicle, but I hoped until the last moment that it wasn't his car. We should see who's there, maybe someone needs help, I said, stopping the car. When we approached, my heart chilled with sorrow because the car turned out to be my son's after all. He was sitting, leaning over the wheel, showing no signs of life, and a trickle of dried blood was visible under his cap. Cursing, I immediately began to shovel away the snow that had piled up by the door, tapping on the glass and calling my son to respond. When I reached him, Scott was unconscious and very cold, but there was still life in him. I asked my friends to help me get him out and carry him to my car. Upon reaching town, I immediately headed towards the hospital as Scott was still unconscious and I was very worried about him. Also, as soon as the phone showed signs of a connection, I immediately dialed my wife's number and informed her that our son had had an accident. Anna first had a fit of hysteria, but then she pulled herself together and also went to the hospital I indicated. The doctors immediately began examining my son and preliminarily reported that his body was too cold, with a slight head injury likely due to the accident. However, his condition was not so critical, and with proper treatment, he should recover. My friends bid farewell to me, wishing Scott a speedy recovery, and went home. After a while, my wife arrived. Seeing our son lying on the bed with a bandaged head and unconscious, she almost fainted. I even had to hold her to prevent her from collapsing. But then she pulled herself together and approached our son, bending over him and crying. I stayed there for a while longer, and then went to the vending machine to get hot coffee for both myself and my wife. Scott's condition was still stable, and warming up a bit after the long journey wouldn't hurt. As I returned, I noticed from the corridor that Anna was leaning too close to our son. At first, I thought he had already regained consciousness, and she was whispering something in his ear. But when I took another step, I saw that she was kissing him directly on the lips. For a moment, it even seemed to me that I had gone mad, for why would she kiss him like that, as if he were not her son, but a lover? Hearing me, Anna immediately distanced herself from him. Wearing a mournful expression, she bombarded me with questions about how everything happened, not giving me a chance to ask my question. Can you tell me what just happened? It seemed like you sucked him directly. Have you lost your mind because of grief? He is our son. You imagine things. Nothing like that happened, I just kissed him. Even though he's not biologically ours, I still love him deeply. I am his mother. And you should respect my feelings for him. Yes, Scott was not our biological son. 
Anna couldn't have children, so we adopted Scott when he was still a baby. She wanted to experience raising a child, changing diapers, and soothing him to sleep. The maternal instinct was strong in her, the only thing missing was the ability to give birth physically. Over the years, she cared for him and showered him with all her love. Even as he grew up, he resembled us in some ways. At that moment, I believed her, thinking it was just my imagination, as I was also quite agitated about his accident. For several days, he remained in the hospital. The doctors took care of him, but for some reason, he didn't regain consciousness. Eventually, the doctors diagnosed him with a coma. They packed his belongings into a box and handed it to me. I later took this box home and left it in the storage. It was terrible news for Anna. She had hardly ever left his bedside, and she had lost a lot of weight over the past few days. And now she was very gloomy. I had to leave the duty at my son's bedside, because I had to go back to work, although my boss suggested that I take a few more days off. But at work I could distract myself a little, and in the evenings I visited the hospital again to find out how my son's condition was, and once again to try to persuade my wife to come home and continue living as before. Maybe later. He needs me now. What if he wakes up and I'm not there? She answered me. And then a few days later, I got a call from my father's friend who lived a few kilometers away from him, but sometimes still came to visit him. By that time, the repair services had restored electricity and communication. My father's friend told me the tragic news that my father had passed away. He apparently died in his sleep and was not in agony. I found him lying in bed with your picture, the man told me. It was another tragic news for me, but I realized that dad was already old, and apparently it was just his time. While Anna continued to nurse her son in the hospital, I went to the funeral. The snow was almost gone by then, and there were no difficulties with the burial. Returning to the city, I went back to the hospital, ready to have a serious conversation with my wife, as she hadn't even attended her father-in-law's funeral. I intended to bring her to her senses, even resorting to a slap if necessary. What's gotten into you? Your father is essentially nobody to me. We couldn't even communicate properly. But our son is still alive, and he needs my support. That's enough. I'm fed up with this. You will go home right now, tidy yourself up, and behave like a normal wife. I couldn't hold back and snapped. Our conversation escalated into an argument, and I indeed had to slap her a couple of times to bring her back to reality. Then, almost pushing her, I drove her home. At home, another quarrel ensued, and I recalled my friend's words about her breezy behavior. I mentioned it to her, and in response, she showered me with a barrage of insults, emphasizing that I valued my friends more than her. I was the first to yield in the argument. We shared a common tragedy, and I understood that unnecessary conflicts were pointless at that moment. More attention needed to be given to our son, hoping for his recovery. The next day, when we went to the hospital together, I approached the doctor who was overseeing Scott's case and wanted to have a serious conversation with him. I wanted to know why they couldn't bring him back to normal. I don't know why it's like this. All medical indicators show that his brain is functioning normally. It's as if something is holding him in his sleep. From a medical standpoint, it's just an anomaly. But don't lose hope. I've seen many cases where people woke up from a coma without any apparent reason. Maybe the same miracle will happen with your son. After the conversation with the doctor, I went to my son's room. I wanted to believe that the doctor was right and that Scott would soon be back on his feet. When I entered, I noticed a faint haze in the room, which immediately disappeared. What were you smoking in here? I asked my wife immediately, who was at that moment looking at something on her phone. Are you out of your mind? Smoking? I don't smoke at all. Did you forget? And true enough. But in such grief, I thought she might have turned to cigarettes to calm her nerves a bit. At the same time, the monitor connected to the sensors on our son's body started emitting a continuous alarm. Anna and I immediately understood that something was wrong with our son. She rushed to him with hysterical screams, and I called for the doctors. Unfortunately, no matter how hard they tried to revive him, they couldn't succeed. Anna was shattered by grief, and I tried to support her as much as I could, understanding the strength and emotions she had invested in this child. I had to endure another funeral in a short period. 
I felt a bit trampled myself and took a couple of weeks off, realizing that I couldn't fully dedicate myself to work. Then the notary called me, and it turned out that my father had prepared some kind of will. However, he requested only my presence, without my wife. It seemed a bit strange, but I followed his request and went to him. There, he first stated what I already suspected, that my father's house was now under my possession. Then he handed me a sealed envelope. Here. In the will, your father instructed that this envelope be given to you after his death. What is this? I asked in surprise. You better find out. I just fulfilled his request. After signing some more papers, I headed home. Anna wasn't there. I called her, and she said she had gone to a friend's place to distract herself. So, I sat in the chair and opened the mysterious envelope. In the letter, my father left me a note. He began by apologizing for not having the courage to tell me about this during his lifetime and then revealed that he was certain about my wife's infidelity. He claimed that Scott, who was not our biological son, was so lavished with love by Anna that she didn't want to share him with anyone. Eventually, as he grew up, she entered into a romantic relationship with him. Reading these lines, I thought the old man had lost his mind. But then I remembered how she kissed Scott, and I continued reading, pouring myself a drink to soften the impact of my father's confession. He went on to say that Anna was not as pure as she seemed. Shortly before his death, he found out that when she was young, she had an affair with one of the hospital orderlies. I recalled the time when she worked as a nurse, but not for long. After the adoption, she quit her job and remained a simple housewife. But that was not all. My father wrote that, besides cheating on me, she was so obsessed with having a child that she resorted to crime. When Scott's biological mother, a single parent, had just given birth to him, Anna somehow administered something to her, some kind of medication, which led to the young mother's death. The baby was left for no one to take care of left without a grandparent, and Anna decided to adopt him. For some reason she liked this child very much. Her lover noticed it, but she somehow managed to persuade him to stay silent, perhaps by threatening to reveal everything to his then young but very jealous wife. Only recently did my father encounter this man again. He found him lost in the woods, sheltered him at his home to warm up, and even offered him homemade moonshine. The guy got heavily drunk and blurted out about the burden on his soul all these years. That's how my father learned about Anna's crime. I read these lines as if in a horror story, unable to believe that it was true. But my father had never lied to me, and I believed him. He continued, stating that he learned about Anna and Scott's relationship through his dreams. Somehow, his dreams often had a prophetic nature. I didn't fully believe in it before, but now my opinion had drastically changed. He talked to Scott, trying to guide him on the right path and suggesting that he leave our family to avoid breaking our marriage. However, Scott refused and even cursed at his grandfather. That's when my father told him he wouldn't allow it in any way. Reading these lines, I got chills. Could it be that my father did something to Scott's car, causing him to have an accident almost immediately? And then this absurd coma, as if my father himself somehow held him and wouldn't let go, and after his death simply took him with him. I pushed the letter aside, unable to believe what I had learned. Could everything really be true? Then I remembered that in the storage room, some of my son's belongings were kept, including his phone. I decided to check it, as there might be some evidence of such a connection with my wife. I frantically searched through the box, and as soon as the phone was in my hands, I started scrolling through the messages. Some of them were indeed from my wife, and when I read them, I realized that my father's words made sense. But how did he find out? Did he just guess, and then expose the little scoundrel during their last conversation? He was good at that. In his younger years, my father worked as a psychologist for a while and was very clever in that business. Maybe his dreams were not prophetic at all, and he simply knew how to analyze the situation well, thus understanding the possible outcome of future events. Unfortunately, I can never ask him about it again. But the fact remained. My wife was cheating on me, and apparently not for the first time. I was so devoted to my feelings for her that I simply didn't notice anything. Then, for some reason, I decided to browse through the photos on Scott's phone, and what I saw there shocked me even more. 
there were several videos with Anna's face visible on the thumbnail. I opened them and watched a few. In the videos, Anna was having fun at some party. Judging by her appearance, I determined that it wasn't too long ago. But what shocked me wasn't that. It was the fact that she wasn't just hanging out with a friend. She had indulged in hugging and kissing some guy after having a good amount to drink. In the next video, I saw the continuation of the party, but there she shamelessly clung to Scott, calling him her little poopsie. The last video completely enraged me because Scott had filmed them making love in some storage room. Anna was so absorbed in it that she didn't even notice the whole process being recorded on the phone camera. I was filled with anger and rage in an instant. I was beside myself with fury. Could this bitch be so treacherous towards me? And she claimed to love and pretended to be the most decent wife. I wanted to tear her apart right then and there. If she had been present at that moment, I swear I would have done it. But she was still somewhere else, not answering my calls for some reason. Probably screwing around with some bastard again, I thought and angrily threw my phone against the wall when she once again didn't answer my call. I didn't know exactly where she was at that moment, otherwise, I would have gone there and confronted her right on the spot. Instead, I just waited for her return, drinking another substantial amount of alcohol. The door opened, and Anna entered the house. I, slightly dozing off in the armchair due to the alcohol, immediately woke up and prepared to confront her as appropriate. She entered the room as if nothing had happened, but seeing my fierce mood, she became wary. Eric, what's wrong? Did something happen again? She asked. Oh, you dirty whore. You were a whore, and you're still a whore. And I believed you. I threw Scott's phone in her direction. So, you love our son so much. I've seen your love. Anna picked up the phone, where the video of them having sex in the storage room was paused, and at that moment, it seemed to me that she was even more surprised than I was. Eric, I. She looked at me, trying to object but immediately received a strong slap. Bitch. And you tried to make a fool out of me? How many have you fucked during our entire life? And a whore? I was so furious that I grabbed her by the hair and forcefully threw her onto the table near the couch. She fell, sprawling on it, and I immediately rushed towards her to hit her again. Anna screamed in pain, and at the same time, realizing that I knew everything about her, she began to apologize. But how could I forgive her for all this? If it were just a 20-year-old affair. I might have thought about it and tried to forgive and live on because all these years she behaved, and I was even happy with her. But I didn't know the whole truth. Murder, betrayal, and now Scott. I kept hitting her until someone rang the doorbell. Only this sudden guest made me stop, otherwise, I might have killed her in a fit of anger. Harry stood at the threshold. He noticed my state and then heard my wife's moans, who, in all this, decided to call for help, probably thinking it was the police. Am I interrupting? He asked in a relatively calm voice. Yes, I replied rudely, but then softened my tone a bit. Sorry. You were right. I should have believed you. Is that your wife there? He asked. Do you want her? Take her. I don't need such a whore. I felt like pulling her out by the hair and throwing her at Harry's feet. But I didn't. I felt suddenly tired. Recent events had worn me out. I went back to my wife and told her to get out of my house and out of my life. I also told her not to go to the police, or else that video from Scott's phone would go viral with lewd comments. Anna soon left me. We even filed for divorce. I didn't want anything more to do with her but I couldn't stay in a house that reminded me of her and Scott. So I sold it and moved into my father's house. I changed jobs, too, and became a gamekeeper, and just as my father had done in recent years, I watched the woods and helped those who got lost in them. Story 2 There were no extraordinary events in my life. I wasn't at the top of the world, but I wasn't at the bottom either. My entire life was measured, without any strong emotional upheavals. I currently worked in a large construction organization, delivering construction materials to specified addresses. I had a wife, Amanda, who worked in a flower shop. She was knowledgeable in the field and knew how to take care of flowers. Amanda and I had been married for a long time. We had an adult son, Richard, who was 26 years old. 
Richard was a smart guy, working in an IT company and earning well. I was proud of my son's achievements, he always tried hard and knew how to achieve his goals. For several years, our son hadn't lived with us. Amanda and I now lived alone in our small house, which I bought 15 years ago and recently fully paid off the mortgage. It was a private house in a quiet and cozy place, with a small yard, a barbecue area, and a gazebo. Everything necessary for excellent relaxation was here. I like my home, my family, my life. I believe that nothing would surprise me in this life anymore. Everything would be just as I thought. But how wrong I was. Unpredictable changes awaited me, about which I had no clue. I had a friend, Stephen, whom I had known for a long time. He was a family friend and often came to visit us. My wife and I also frequently visited him. Stephen's family life hadn't worked out. This guy was single. Somehow, he had difficulties with girls. But he didn't take advantage of the benefits of a single life either. Stephen wasn't attached to anything and earned quite well. He could travel, attend numerous parties, lead a carefree lifestyle, as he owed nothing to anyone. But Stephen was a different kind of person. He enjoyed spending quiet evenings at home or immersing himself in his work. Also, he always enjoyed seeing us with my wife. Back then, I noticed that he was very fond of Amanda. He often complimented her, listened attentively to everything she said. He literally never took his eyes off her. I saw this, but for some reason, I didn't feel jealous of Amanda. My wife and I often discussed that Stephen was not indifferent to her. But it didn't manifest in anything more. Stephen was a good friend, and I trusted him. I knew he would never allow himself anything inappropriate. We felt sorry for him with Amanda. We wanted him to be happy, but unfortunately, Stephen couldn't decide to start dating someone. But one day I noticed flowers at home. It was a bouquet of yellow tulips. I asked Amanda where the flowers came from. She said that at work, the director decided to give a gift to all female employees. I didn't attach much importance to it. After all, what was I supposed to think? Start suspecting my wife right away? Of course not. I believed her. But still, I noticed some secrecy in my wife's behavior. I didn't connect it with jealousy. I just didn't understand what was happening with my wife. Later, my wife unexpectedly signed up for evening yoga classes. Now she began to appear at home less and less often. I didn't imagine free time like this. I thought we would drink wine and enjoy various dishes or simply watch TV together on the couch. But I got the impression that Amanda didn't need all this. Although she used to enjoy spending time like that with me. But now she seemed to be avoiding me. She often sat in her silly social networks. One day, I saw the monitor turn on with Amanda receiving many messages from concerned guys. It deeply upset me. Amanda, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time. Explain to me what's happening with you. Frank, why are you asking? Don't pretend that nothing is happening. I see that you're just avoiding me. Your yoga, which you attend almost every day, your late night walks with girlfriends, your social networks where dozens of concerned idiots write to you, what does it all mean? Frank, this is my life. I have the right to do whatever I want. I'm not cheating on you. I just decided to develop new interests. Yoga helps me a lot. And I like to socialize. I don't pay attention to messages from various idiots. They're everywhere. I only talk to my friends, and new acquaintances mean nothing to me. Besides, it's none of your business to invade my messages. It violates personal boundaries, you know? Yes, Amanda, I'm sorry I invaded your messages. It happened accidentally, but I was just horrified by what I saw. I don't want to violate your personal boundaries, but I don't understand why you don't want to spend time with me. I'm not avoiding you. I just want to change my life a bit. I love you, and we'll spend time together. Right now, a new stage of life has begun for me. I want to put everything in order. And then we can enjoy each other's company. But all of it was just words. Amanda continued to behave strangely. I began to suspect that she was cheating on me, but with whom? Could Stephen be involved in this? But that couldn't be. Could I really know so little about my best friend? 
but I didn't see any other men around Amanda with whom she could have a good rapport. Of course, she could be lying to me and meeting guys online. But could Amanda be so deceitful to me? And one day, I noticed the computer was on again. The temptation was too great, and I started digging into Amanda's messages again. But I found nothing, absolutely nothing. Everything was meticulously cleaned, the entire message history. This was also very strange. Why would she do that? Simple and logical conclusions suggested themselves. She was definitely hiding something from me. And with each passing day, I wanted to know the truth more and more. Then I began to notice how Stephen frequented the store where Amanda worked. I saw this when I came to pick her up from work or just drop by when I had free time. Several times, I bumped into Stephen. He behaved very uncertainly and nervously at the sight of me, then quickly left. Now it seemed even more strange to me. I tried to talk to Amanda, but she dismissed all my suspicions as foolish and groundless. But everything pointed to something happening between Amanda and Stephen. I tried talking to Stephen, but he, too, was puzzled by my questions. He assured me that there was nothing between him and Amanda and never had been. He said he was trying to improve his personal life, so he started seeing us less often. I didn't want to become a paranoid husband, jealous of Amanda to the whole world. So I didn't press Stephen. But then, what was happening if Stephen wasn't involved? My head was already aching from all these thoughts. Amanda and I had been together for a long time, and I had never suspected her of infidelity before. Could she really stoop to such nastiness after so many years? I didn't know what to do. I couldn't find any answers to my questions. I would have talked about it all with Stephen, but he, too, was behaving strangely. I wanted to blame him for encouraging my wife, but I had no substantial evidence. I concluded that I would have to keep an eye on my own wife. Initially, it seemed silly. But I saw no other way to find out the whole truth. Amanda continued to avoid me and reassure me, always saying that nothing was happening. It was an ordinary evening. Amanda was getting ready for her yoga session. As soon as she left the house, I exited through the back door and got into the car. I saw Amanda getting into her car and driving away. I followed her. And when we arrived, my heart began to beat faster. Anger and rage boiled inside me. We pulled up right in front of Stephen's house. Amanda got out of the car and headed straight into the house. Oh, you bastards. So you don't interact, and there's nothing between you. Shameless liars. I thought. So the best friend I knew so well and trusted was secretly seeing my wife. After all, I doubted that the yoga session was taking place at Stephen's house. I calmed down a bit and headed into Stephen's house. I didn't bother knocking on the door. I wanted to catch these bastards off guard. The door wasn't locked and I entered the house. I quietly closed the door behind me and went in search of Amanda and Stephen. I saw light seeping through the slightly open door leading to Stephen's bedroom. Sweat poured down my forehead. The worst thing I feared was confirmed. I approached the bedroom and swung the door open. Shock paralyzed me. I saw my wife having sex with a little bastard named Richard. I knew the scoundrel, but I couldn't believe what I saw. He was Stephen's nephew, barely 18 years old. But what the hell was he doing here? My thoughts jammed. I entered the room, grabbed a tall floor lamp, and hit Richard on the back with all my strength. Richard collapsed to the floor. Amanda began to scream, covering her nudity. Then I lifted this little bastard from the floor and pressed him against the wall with the lamp. The lamp's pole pressed against his throat. He began to wheeze and choke. He tried to break free, but I continued to press forcefully on his throat. The bastard began to suffocate. I wanted to decapitate him with the lamp pole. I continued to press with all my might. Horror and helplessness flickered in the eyes of this bastard. He couldn't say or do anything. Frank! Please, let him go. You'll kill him. Amanda screamed. Shut up, you creature. He'll die, and I'll get to you too. I shouted, continuing to strangle this little bastard. Suddenly, I felt a blow to my head. Losing my balance, my legs gave way, and I collapsed to the floor. Amanda struck me on the head with something. 
the little bastard also fell to the floor, greedily gasping for air while clutching his throat. Amanda rushed towards me again, attempting to strike me on the head once more with a stool. However, I was still conscious and grabbed the stool from her hands. Then I pushed Amanda away, she fell, and I stood up. You filthy creature. How could you do this to me? We've always been together, and now you decide to betray me, in such a dirty way? I suspected it was Stephen all along. But I couldn't even imagine you'd be fooling around with his nephew. We both held him in our arms when he was just a little kid, when his brother visited Stephen. What were you thinking? It's just awful. And you, you little bastard. What have you become? This is madness. Amanda, you're just despicable. I yelled, holding the stool above Amanda's head. Yes, Frank, you're right. It's horrible. It's just horrible. You're right. I got tangled up in myself. I just went to Stevens, and he wasn't home. But Kevin was there. I started talking to him, and I don't even know how we ended up doing it. Forgive me, please. Forgive me. Amanda cried. No. I'm not forgiving that. You betrayed everything good between us. This is unforgivable. And I don't want to see you anymore. Both of you, go to hell. I said and smashed the stool on the floor. I ran out of that house, enveloped in anger and agony. It felt like my heart had been ripped out. It was an unbearable pain. I went to a late night pub, where I stayed until morning, drowning my sorrows in alcohol. But it didn't make things easier. It took me a long time to recover from what had happened. Later, Stephen came to me. He apologized for his nephew. He had no idea what was going on. He had a girlfriend now, spending most of his time with her, and he only visited Amanda for advice and flowers. He didn't rush to tell me everything, wanting to make sure something good would come out of these relationships. Kevin came to stay with him for a while because his parents were going through a divorce and constantly quarreling. He never thought Kevin and Amanda were capable of such things. The anger had already subsided in me, and I understood Stephen wasn't involved. So, I didn't blame him. However, Amanda started a legal war with me. She wanted to take away as much as possible in the divorce. She threatened me, seeking any way to make me forgive her, saying she would take everything away if I didn't. But her threats only convinced me that she was no longer the woman I loved. Amidst the depths of these passions, an unforeseen incident occurred. It was a pitch dark night, and I was peacefully asleep in my house. Suddenly, I woke up, coughing. Acrid smoke surrounded me, making it impossible to see anything. My house was on fire. The flames were spreading rapidly, and I didn't know how to escape. Gasping for air, I moved from one fire source to another. The heat was closing in on me. Beams from the roof began to fall, blocking my way. I inhaled smoke, and I had too little strength to get out of the house. I started losing consciousness, lying on the floor. The last thing I remembered was Amanda grabbing me and dragging me outside. I woke up in the hospital. I had burns but they were not fatal. My head hurt terribly. Stephen was by my side. He explained what had happened. The little bastard, Kevin, couldn't accept that Amanda no longer wanted to see him, that she still loved me. And Kevin just went crazy. He told her that if she didn't meet him, he would burn the house down. Amanda didn't fully believe that Kevin was capable of such a thing, but she decided not to ignore his threats when he wrote that he was already on his way to my house. She went to warn me, but she was late. She called me, but my phone was on silent. When she arrived, the house was already brightly ablaze, and that sick bastard stood across with an empty gasoline canister, enjoying the spectacle. Amanda grabbed a stick, sneaked up behind him, and knocked Kevin out. Then she burst into the house and pulled me outside. Kevin ended up behind bars. He behaved defiantly with the judges, so he got quite a substantial sentence. Amanda waived her claim to the property, and she didn't bother me anymore. When I recovered, I decided to talk to her. I changed my mind. I decided that each of us should continue our lives, despite past mistakes. I thanked her for saving me and forgave her. We didn't live together anymore, but we decided to remain friends. After that, 
my life gradually started improving. My house was insured, so I managed to rebuild it even better than it was before. It seemed like Amanda was doing well too. But I was wrong, her dark side wouldn't let her go. She met some kid online. He was a drug addict and a liar. He robbed Amanda and killed her. However, his life didn't last long. Soon, the police found him dead in some alley. He died from a drug overdose. As for Kevin, Stephen later told me his sad story. Kevin couldn't endure imprisonment and went insane. He was sent to a psychiatric hospital, but they couldn't help him. Kevin ended his life by suicide. And so, this story concluded. My world turned upside down, but I kept on living. Of course, I felt lonely, but I tried not to dwell on it. I didn't have to spend the rest of my life alone. I felt hope for a happy future when I met Margaret. The insurance money wasn't enough to buy new furniture, so I had to save up. Margaret was a designer I hired to create a cozy atmosphere in the house again. The more we communicated, the closer we became. She had dedicated her whole life to work, and her personal life hadn't worked out. She was also lonely. She had given up on the idea of a normal family life. But we managed to save each other from loneliness. Now we live together, enjoying every new day.